Device, and I'm sure this will do it. Keep it on, keep it going. Think we're good now, almost positive we're good now. Yes, sound, okay. Okay, let me proportion it. <laughs> Jeez, guys, sorry. Let me proportion this and uh, we'll be good so you can see our lovely mugs. So for now, guys, what we're gonna do is we got the, we got the awesomely talented Phil Hall as my special guest tonight. Uh, in order to make this work, it's kind of complicated because uh, I need this special adapter that's not working out. Anyway, so I'm gonna be audio for the first like 30 minutes until my computer charges. And then for the second half, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm gonna be on the screen as well. But until then, let's just get started. Phil, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> of course this happens when one of my favorite guests gets invited on the show, uh, but it is none other than uh, Phil Hall, you guys, if uh, you've, you've heard me mention Phil in some of my shows, uh, I read and I reference some of his uh, his articles and some of his works. Phil has such an incredible resume and just a really, really unique guy. And we're going to get into all of that um, uh, in momentarily. But uh, Bill is, uh, I mean, Phil, sorry, is currently a journalist for Benzinga. He's a former UN radio reporter. Um, he's an author of like 10 books. And uh, he's host of a few different shows right now, including one that I had the pleasure of being a guest on recently. But anyway, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome the one and only Phil Hall to Steven Steele Live. Phil, how you feeling, man? And thank you for your patience. <laughs> can you hear me, Phil? <laughs> I don't think Phil can hear me. <laughs> Hold on. This is wild stuff. Okay. Phil, can you hear me? Now he can hear me. <laughs> oh, this is so, the settings are so crazy. Well, Phil, I still can't hear you, but for what it's worth, I gave you a heck of an intro. Um, so, <laughs> I gave you a heck of an intro, and so we're trying to figure it out uh, right now. Um, how about this, gang? <laughs> Just, just a moment. Just a moment. Okay, recording. There we go. Join in. There we go. All right. And Phil can hear me. He can hear me, but I can't hear him. This is a this is a setting issue. We might have to start a new stream momentarily, but uh, just give me give us a moment to work it out, gang. Fortunately, we got some really patient folks. <laughs> so thank you guys. I know you guys are good chatters, and you, you you love talking amongst yourselves. It's the one of the advantages of having a strong. Um, a very strong uh, community. Uh, let's see here. Phil, can you give me a old one two there, sir? I thought I heard him. Okay. 
I can hear. I I could hear you. Mo I could hear. I thought I could hear you there, Phil. Um. Uh, Phil, can you hear me? Okay, Phil, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. And now the question is, can the, can the fine folks uh, hear, uh, hear you as well? So we'll just, uh, we'll wait for them to catch up and see if we can uh, make, make a go of this, sir. Okay. Uh, but I can, I can finally hear you and we are, right. uh, and we'll see. Uh, Kryptonian coming up with a $4 super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, couldn't find a meter, but here's four bucks. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, we'll wait for, we'll wait for it. And I, I think we're all good on this end. Hopefully we're all good on that end. Uh, we're getting uh, one yes, uh, one what's up, guys. Uh, we'll wait for it. Yes, we can hear Phil now. Okay. 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 I th yes. Yes. Yeah, I think we're good to go. At last, uh, Phil, thank you for braving through the, toughing it out with me through the uh, technical difficulties here. It's really unfortunate because I was super, I've been super excited to have you on as a guest and I haven't had any technical difficulties for well over six months. I know I'm an amateur streamer, but my goodness. Uh, anyway, I appreciate and appreciate the crowd hanging in there. And uh, thank you, Phil, so much for joining us. As I was saying before, you guys, uh, Phil, uh, I'm sure you've heard my heard his name on my show from time to time because I do reference some of his articles and his works here and uh, he, he's just one of my one of my favorite writers out there and the more you look into a guy like Phil the more you see just how unusually talented he is in a multitude of ways and his resume resume really and his work body of work really precedes itself uh, he's currently a journalist for Benzinga former UN uh, radio reporter author of like 10 books uh, he's a host of a couple of programs which we're going to talk about uh, and so much more. Phil Hall, sir, loving the bolo. Thank you for joining us tonight. How are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling fine. I know what it's like because I've done... First of all, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? I hear you perfectly. And you folks out there, if you hear us, let us know in the chat room. And if you haven't smashed the like button, smash it. But anyway, uh, I used to do live radio some years ago. I was on an internet radio show called PPRN Radio. It was hosted by Peter... Pinho, and it was live broadcast, and anything that could go wrong on a live broadcast went wrong in spades. <laughs> okay, so uh, you're... I know. Am I allowed to use uh, slightly salty language on the show? Yeah, you can get you can get a little spicy for sure, sir. Okay. Because we had something that happened once on live radio, which uh, I was thinking about today in preparation of the show. We had Joey Fatone as a guest. And Joey Fatone's, I don't know if you know him or if you've ever worked with him. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, he was in and, the, the boy band. Uh, that's right. Among and, other things, yeah. Among other things. And I had booked him on the show because I was producing the show at the time. He was promoting some sort of, uh, I think it was a fire alarm or some sort of product like that. And I contacted his publicist and I said that uh, we'd like to have Mr. Fatone as a guest, but... Be aware that PPRN Radio is an uh, adult comedy show, so some of the, the language might get a little salty. And the yes. publisher said, okay. So we started the interview. Actually, uh, Peter Pino, the host, was doing most of the interview. And we we're talking about uh, this product that Joey Fatone was promoting. And this is all live on the air. And then uh, we Peter went into his R rated uh, mode and said, So, Joey, when you were out on the road all those years, did you get a lot of pussy? <laughs> and at which point the publicist disconnected the phone call. Yeah. And this was this was live on the air, and Peter and I were in the studio. We had some other people with us, and we were like, "What happened? Just lost him." He said, "Maybe his cell phone lost service." It, it didn't dawn on us that we asked a completely inappropriate question in the worst possible manner, and we were sitting there talking to ourselves on live radio for about two or three minutes. Yeah. And I suggested, let's call him back. Maybe we just lost connection. That happens. It doesn't happen, but it doesn't sound like a good idea. So we call back, and and I took out the phone, and I said, in complete sincerity, we were doing an interview with Mr. Fatone, and we somehow got disconnected. Can you please put him back on? Amazingly, they did. And we completed the interview, and he was a wonderful guy. He even recorded a promotion uh, for us. And the next day, I got the most horrible, nasty email from his publicist saying how dare you uh, have Joey on this type of a show and ask these type of questions this type of language and I said 
I told you that this was an adult comedy show. What were you expecting? And right. Was like, and the, but I, so I mean, if I could survive uh, insulting Joey Fatone on live radio, I could survive this. <laughs> I love that story, and yeah, that must have been kind of frustrating for you because you know he knew the context uh, going into it. Yeah. He wasn't offended at all. He made he made an off color remark about uh, Lance Bass. It was it was very funny. Uh, <laughs> but his publicist just had no sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently, um, they're saying you're voice sounds a little bit distorted so uh phil hang tight i think i got a quick fix for it and then uh i'll be back in like literally five seconds okay oh boy <laughs> okay all right i think we're are back here and there we go, the recording room. All right. Okay. We're back. We're back. And uh, maybe this is better. Hopefully it's better, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, guys. But nevertheless, uh, people are really feeling uh, Phil out of the gate. Uh, someone says Phil is a savage. Uh, someone, else, <laughs> someone else said based Phil and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Someone else says the fact that... Uh, Phil also saw, sounds part Android, makes him more badass. So there you go, Phil. Uh, <laughs> rave reviews out of the gate from the Steven Steele community. Um, yeah, that, that's the, and which which program was that that uh, that Joey Fatone was on? It was called PPRN Radio. It's an internet radio show. It's uh, it was on Spreaker at the time. I don't know if it still is, but uh, I did the show for about two years, and we had uh, it was a live show. We ne we never pre-recorded, and yeah. We, we've had we had people walk off the show midstream because uh, <laughs> our language got so offensive. Uh, we had Bob Backlund, if you remember him, the old time wrestler. He was in the studio with us, and he got angry because there was a, a young lady uh, who was also a guest, and he felt we were being rude to her, and he just uh, really just stopped the show, started yelling at us to, to be more polite, and we we're like, oh, all right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, how long did you do that show, Phil? I did that show for two years, and it was uh, two of the happiest years of my life uh, doing the show. Uh, and I, I actually I began in radio when I was back in college, and when I got out of college, I, I put broadcasting aside and focused on being a writer. Okay. Uh, and came back to the show. This is around. I came back. I was there about 2014 to 2016. Okay. Got it. Got it. Uh, Ten dollars super chat coming through from Jason Huffman for the ten bucks for the saltiness. I'll take it, my friend. Thanks for helping keep the lights no, 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 on. No, no. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Good. I, okay. I'll forward I, it. I'll forward it over to I, Phil. <laughs> to me, I take dollars. I take uh, pound sterling. I take Swiss franc. I take Dogecoin, of course. I also take firstborn. So. Uh, <laughs> for Rosemary's baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so. You know, another thing about, another fascinating thing I, I found out about you as I started to more deep dive into your, your, your past here is you were the youngest reporter to cover the United Nations. I, I believe you started at the age of, ripe age of 19. Uh, how did that, how did that evolve? How did you find yourself in such a position at such a young age? You know the old saying, it's not what you know, but who you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew the right person, and I got an internship uh, with a college professor of mine named Moses Schoenfeld. I went to Pace University, also known as Old PU, and <laughs> um, Dr. Schoenfeld had a one-man office at the UN. He had a company called Fairchild Broadcast News, and he did uh, syndicated news coverage from the UN, which he sold to radio stations around the U.S. and Canada. And uh, summer of 1984, uh, he gave me an internship at the UN. And at first it wasn't really much. I was just uh, running around delivering tapes between studios and gathering paper and uh, bringing guests from the lobby to his studio to record shows. And about two and a half weeks into the internship, uh, Dr. Schoenfeld told me he was going to the hospital for quadruple bypass surgery. And he said, you have to go on the air and uh, cover the news for me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I was a 19 year old kid from the Bronx and I sounded like a 19 year old kid from the Bronx and I didn't think I could pull it off but he said you can do it and sure enough I did and when he got out of the hospital I stayed there for about two years as a reporter with his uh, news bureau so that's how I made journalism history. 
Right. That that is incredible. That is incredible. We're when you first uh, went live in the in a gig like that. I mean, were your nerves just like crazy? I mean, how how are you feeling when you when you first you know first started reporting it within that capacity? Well, I was very self conscious about the way I sounded because yeah. I'm I'm from the Bronx and at the time I had. Uh, two things going against me. I had two speech impediments, not just one. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't pronounce a TH sound. It would sometimes come out as a D, and that's being from where I grew up, because uh, that would be that, and this would be this. The Bronx is the Bronx. That, that's how we, we all speak back then. Nobody yeah. realizes there's anything wrong. But I also couldn't pronounce uh, a TH. It sometimes came out as an F, so three would be free, and through would be through. Yeah. So I really sounded ridiculous, and I also had, uh, at 19, my voice was somewhat more high-pitched. Yeah. And the idea of going on radio <laughs> as a United Nations reporter, uh, sounding like an idiot, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> sort of scared me. And I was yeah. wondering, well, what am I going to do about this? And as luck would have it, uh, the night that Dr. Schoenfeld had told me I was going to take over for him, there was a movie on TV called A Man for All Seasons. It's a very famous British film made in 1966, it won the Best Picture Oscar that year, and the star of the movie was an actor named Paul Schofield, who was a British stage actor. He didn't do a lot of films, but I was watching the film and I was listening to how he was speaking, and I'm saying to myself, I, I want to sound that way. How do I sound that way? And I wasn't really watching the film as so much as I was listening to it, and I realized how he spoke, which was speak slowly, I tend to speak rather quickly, speak clearly. I uh -huh. saw my my, my uh, words, lower your voice, my voice was a somewhat higher pitch, soften your vowels, being from New York, we, we really crash into the vowels uh, with a chisel, and I found myself actually being able to have a crash course in diction, where I was able to go from being a, a nasally teenager to somebody who actually sounded a little bit intelligent on the air. Mm. And I was able to uh, to keep that uh, that voice since sometimes when I, either I'm very relaxed or very angry, uh, yeah. my real speaking voice comes out. But otherwise, uh, I stayed with the voice. And as I've gotten older, my voice has gotten somewhat deeper as well. So that helps. And uh, that's uh, that I overcame my nerves. And since then, I really have not been self-conscious about anything uh, in terms of my presentation, whether it's vocally or physically, as in, you know, when you're 19, you don't realize that you're you're a 19-year-old among adults. I just figured, right. oh, I'm here, so I, I belong here. So that really wasn't an issue. But uh, I find that when somebody speaks with a level of authority in their voice, uh, they, they wind up getting a lot more respect, even if they don't quite deserve it. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I guess that kind of goes back to the old uh, saying, fake it till you make it, right? And uh, it, it, it sounds like you really kind of Force yourself to sh shake yourself out of your, out of your comfort zone, and then uh, the rest the rest is history, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Julio Cadino, thank uh, Julio, thank you for the five dollar super chat, guys. If you haven't smashed that like button, feel free to do so. Also, feel Smash free to like go on my uh, tw Twitter page and retweet the stream so other folks know that we are live here tonight. And um, anyway, anyway, uh, getting back to it. So, um, uh, you have written. Uh, an extraordinary amount of, of books, in my opinion. Uh, what what was the what was the first book that you wrote, and uh, uh, how old were you at that time? The first book that I wrote was something I was not supposed to write. It was a book called The Encyclopedia of Underground Movies. It came out in two thousand four. <laughs> I was working for the uh, the website Film Thread at the time, and Chris Gore, who was the editor of Film Thread. Uh, had been contracted to write the book for Michael Weesey Productions, but for whatever reason, he wasn't able to do it, and he called me and he said, would you like to write this book? I said, no, I'm not doing anything. And so I wrote the book, and that was number one, and uh, the company liked the book enough that they gave me my own contract for a second book, and uh, then I went over to another company, uh, Bear Man and Media, where most of my other books have been published since then, and I've just been uh, writing the most recent one, came out last year. Uh, it was called Jesus Christ Movie Star, and it's a, <laughs> a story. It's a, it, it focuses on how the movies have portrayed Jesus going back to the 1890s. In fact, one mm. of the most surprising things I found about the subject while doing the research was that some of the very first films ever made were about 
Jesus. And uh, the book traces the history of Jesus on the big screen from the 1890s all the way up to today's digital cinema. Wow, wow, fantastic. Um, and so was so Jesus Christ movie star is your most recent book your most recent book? Yes. Okay. It came out last year from Bear Mana Media and it's uh, still the books are all available. So just go to Am you, actually you have to be careful because when you go to Amazon and you type my name there are about 10 other writers named Phil Hall out there. So mm. Uh, just be careful which one you're you're choosing. I mean, I'm glad the other ones can get book sales, but I, I really deserve it more than they do. <laughs> <laughs> so your your relationship with film didn't just start and end with writing and journalism. You were also an actor, so much so, and I didn't know this about you until I went more deep diving. But you've appeared in about 25 movies and uh, also appeared in. A, a, a few productions as yourself uh, in a variety of documentaries. Um, what was kind of the your your wildest experience in terms of what film that you, you were involved with as an actor? Well, the wildest experience I had as an actor was in a movie called Bikini Bloodbath <laughs> Car Wash. Yes. And I'll ask, yes. And if, has anybody out there in watching this video ever seen Bikini Bloodbath Car Wash? Uh, Say so in the in the chat room, and we I'll follow up on that later. But uh, I played a creepy college professor who gets killed in the movie by a maniac chef, uh, <laughs> and my death scene uh, comes towards the end of the film, where uh, the chef is in the house with myself and about a half dozen bikini girls, and I'm running to the exit, and I pull open the front door, and the chef is there with his meat cleaver, and he lands it square into my skull, and I fall on the ground. Uh, my blood rushing out of my head. <laughs> so this was a no-budget movie, so uh, we had to be careful in terms of the stunts and making a mess because we were filming it in the director's brother's home. So for my death scene, they laid me on the floor and they took a tube and stuck it into my uh, jacket up through the sleeve and they said to me, you have to hold your hand over your head and in the tube's going to be red corn syrup, make believe it's blood, and it's gonna rush up and it'll look like that it's bleeding out of your skull and just hold the hand, make sure the tube's not on camera and it'll look great. We can only do it once because uh, we only had one jacket for me in that scene. And a wonderful young lady named Sherry uh, was the production assistant and it was her job to pump the corn syrup through the tube. They uh -huh. actually had an old fashioned bicycle pump to put this through and if you saw sherry sherry uh she, she was a very thin frail girl you would think that if you just uh w went uh, like this uh it would knock her over that's that's how it was and so uh i said okay get on the floor put your hand over your uh your skull and uh they yelled action and uh, Sherry might have looked frail, but uh, she could have probably knocked out Mike Tyson because she pumped down with a fury that was wow. so great that the corn syrup shot up through the tube in my sleeve <laughs> into my nostrils. Yeah. <laughs> all over my face. And I started drowning because oh my corn gosh. syrup went into my... and I could not breathe. And my face was all covered in the, this, this muck. But I realized if I started to uh, to complain, we would ruin the shot and uh, have to do it. So I, I braved it out and did this for about uh, 10 seconds until the director yelled, cut. And I w until I was able to get all of this corn syrup out of my nostrils and out, out of my uh, my system, it was, it was a, a complete shambles. I honestly thought I was going to, uh, if not die, certainly was gonna pass out because it's uh, it's a terrifying feeling to oh have your, uh, your furnaces clogged with, with corn syrup. Uh, wow. What's funny is that about a year later, the film was entered in the B-Movie Film Festival, and I won the Best Supporting Actor Award for <laughs> that film. And I, I sort of think that it, they gave it to me for the uh, the death sequence, but uh, I really wasn't acting. I was, I was the yeah. monk. So in a way, I didn't deserve the award because that's not acting, that's real life. Yeah, I was just about to. I was just about to ask you that. I was because I, I was thinking as you were telling me that, I'm like, well, do you think they gave you the award because 
you actually thought you were dying while you were being filmed, and it sounds like that was the case, and you were genuinely uh, probably terrified in that moment, choking on corn syrup blood. Yeah, that was. Uh, those were the circumstances that prevailed. But the film was very popular, and then I came back to the next one. There were actually three of those films. There was the first Bikini Bloodbath. Yeah. I got killed in that film. Then Bikini Bloodbath Car Wash, and I got killed in that film. And then Bikini Bloodbath Christmas, and I also got killed in that. Most of my films, I, I tend to get killed. I, <laughs> play, I play the creepy villain who gets badly killed at the end. I've had. I've been chopped up with a meat cleaver. I've been disemboweled with a claw hammer. I've. Uh, Died in a car crash off screen, mercifully, though they had my mangled body on screen afterwards. I've been shot. Uh, I've been vivisected by a, a mad surgeon, which was a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah, so. Uh, wow. You need to, if anybody out there is a filmmaker and you need somebody to die in a movie, just please uh, contact you, me through Stephen and I'll be on your set. Yeah, you're the go-to man. You're the go-to guy, and in that, uh, that's a real, real specialized niche there. So, out of all three of the uh, bloodbath bikini films that you're in, which one are you most partial to? I, I like Bikini Bloodbath Car Wash because I obviously I won the award. I, I I had a lot of screen time in Bikini Bloodbath Christmas, and what's interesting <laughs> in that film is um, we had one scene. I'm supposed to get into a hot tub. I'm playing the sleazy delicatessen owner. Okay. And there's these two beautiful women who work for me, and I'm supposed to get into a hot tub with them. And I said to the uh, director, oh, so how are we going to shoot it? And said, the director Tom Seymour said, You'll, they'll be in the hot tub, and you just pull down your pants and just get it. And I said, what am I supposed to be wearing under my pants? And you, could, you said, you could wear your underwear. And I said, you know something, that's just not really, uh, that's just not funny. What would happen if... I pulled down my pants and I w wasn't wearing anything. You get a bigger laugh that way. <laughs> and he said, "Okay, we'll do it, but don't we're not don't say anything to anybody, including." And so nobody knew, ex not even the two women, uh, Rachel Robbins and Margaret Champagne. God love them. They were in the the hot tub. Uh huh. Uh, and Tom, the director, yelled, uh, "Action!" And I walk over to the hot tub. The camera's behind me. Pull down my pants, and there's no underwear. And I get into the hot tub and I actually put my leg up in a way so uh, my balls are hanging down. Yeah, uh, and yeah. You can see them. And then I, I jump into the hot tub and, and swim over. To... I mean, Rachel and Margaret were wonderful actresses. They didn't break character. They didn't start laughing or, or get upset or anything. It was just like, oh, this is just, this stuff happens every day. Sure. And, and the, the people behind the, the camera, mercifully, they didn't, yell or, or laugh or anything so it was done in <laughs> one take and it was uh it's it's a, an extraordinary feeling to be completely naked in front of a, a group of people because on, we had about a half dozen people behind the camera and yeah plus the director and plus the two women in the hot tub with me and i was the only one who's uh not wearing clothing but uh i felt completely comfortable with that and it was interesting because when the film when they were editing the film they were wondering uh, could they get away with this because you you for mainstream movies, you rarely see uh, an actor's balls hanging on the screen, but they felt they, they felt it was such a funny uh, side gag. They would keep it, and they did keep it. And though, if you see the trailer online, they have a big censored bar over that part of my anatomy. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! That's fantastic. Um, well, before we move, before I, I pivot to uh, the the next topic, I, I have to I have to ask. Um, I mean, you were in 25 films. Now that we now we know three out of 25 of them involved bloodbaths and bikinis. Uh, outside of that, um, what 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 is what what really stands up as far as uh, the film that you were involved with? Like something that you uh, you enjoy viewing today? I liked. It was a movie called Uncorked. It was a 37-minute uh, film. I was the only person in the film. I actually wrote the film. Eric Schrader was the director, Aaron Sandler was the sound person, and I play a drunk who's sitting on a park bench mm. on a winter day, and a camera crew comes up to me, and I just start talking to them about my life. Uh, turns out that this drunk is not the, the nicest person. He's very lazy. He's, uh, he's always fighting with his wife. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't listen to his doctor's orders. Uh, he, he turns out he was a juvenile delinquent uh, when he was a young person, and... I enjoyed doing it, and it was funny too because it was done in one unbroken take. And I wrote the the film, but there was no written script. I had the whole thing memorized in my head, and, and 
Eric Schrader and Aaron Sandler uh, had faith in me that they, they could we could all pull this off. And we went to a park in New Haven, Connecticut on a December afternoon and yes. sat down and we just did it in one, I did it in one take. Uh, you can find it on, on YouTube. Okay. Uh, if you uncorked uh, Phil Hall and, and to me it was, uh, I've gotten a lot of praise for that. And, and the fact, I did the film too because I wanted to show that a film could be made quickly and cheaply uh, in just one day. Uh, it, as I said, it was 37-minute uh, monologue, which was just shot unbroken. They put a few insert scenes uh, into it, and the whole thing cost ten dollars. And that went was oh for my a bottle, gosh. Of, bottle of cognac that I bought as a prop, because Eric and Aaron had their own equipment, so uh, they didn't need to buy anything. We shot it in a park, so there was no need for building a set, and I just wore my own clothing. So uh, you got a ten-dollar movie, and the funny thing is. Uh, it's been on Amazon, and it's already more than earned its cost back because people have bought DVDs of it. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's amazing that, obviously, that you pulled it off with with, with $10, but um, it's even more satisfying to know that it's a, it's a body work that holds up well that uh, people, are, people are still enjoying today. Uh, now, when did, you, uh, make a, uh, when did you make a pivot towards uh, working for Benzinga, and starting to mix it up uh, with uh, writing about cryptocurrency. Well, I've always been a financial writer. When you see, I'm very good at multitasking. So I, while I was doing radio shows and while I was doing the movies, I also had full-time work as a financial journalist. And uh, for years, I primarily focused on real estate and the mortgage market. And I started writing about crypto, uh, I think it would have been around maybe 2014. 13, 2014, hmm. uh, when they started to have Bitcoin transactions uh, regarding house purchases. So the, at the time, they were just starting to uh, tiptoe into that market. So uh, I also later wrote about Libra. Remember when uh, Facebook decided to, they wanted their own cryptocurrency, which didn't quite happen. Right. And <laughs> I, I joined Benzinga uh, last January, actually. I was there, it was interesting, I was there for a two-week trial. Uh, they wanted to make sure that I could write. I, I guess they, they were sort of skeptical of me, but after two weeks, uh, they felt, oh, he could write. Let's I'll hire him. And so I've been writing for them since uh, my official start date was February 8 of uh, 2021. And mm. so I just recently had my first anniversary. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, guys, if you are just uh, tuning in, you are watching Steven Steele Live with my special guest, uh, Phil Hall. Um, and it's just been so far just a uh, really fascinating, amazing conversation. If you have any questions for Phil, feel free to put them in the chat. Obviously, super chats are always appreciated for time and efforts put in. But either way, feel free to put them in the chat, guys. And if you haven't uh, hit the like button, make sure uh, you smash it. It's uh, hugely helpful. Um, get it. Get I just want to answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. I want to answer a question from the chat room. Uh, yes, weed is legal in Connecticut, uh, both medicinal and recreational. So uh, if you just want to calm down or you want to take care of that nagging cough, come to Connecticut. We've got weed. <laughs> you know, that would be a, that could be a pretty successful slogan for the state. Just uh, <laughs> straight to it, you know. It's a um, <laughs> so uh, since you've been writing, uh, since you've been writing about uh, cryptocurrency um, and for Benzinga, etc., what are a few things that uh, kind of piqued your curiosity more that perhaps have stood out in the space um, out of all the things that you've been surveying? I think the most interesting thing about uh, crypto that I've encountered uh, came from my mother, strangely enough. Um, shortly after I was started writing for Benzinga, my mother asked me a question and she said, uh, what is Bitcoin? And so it's funny because I've written about Bitcoin Hey, uh, say hi to Diamond Hands Freddy. What's up, uh, fella? All's well. Anyway, um, I was writing about Bitcoin, but you know, I'm writing for an audience of people who know what crypto is. Uh, yeah. My mother, uh, she's going to be 88 later this month, so God bless her for that. Uh, she's not, she wasn't really keeping up with this aspect of the financial services world, and she was under the impression that Bitcoin was an actual coin, a metal, metallic coin. And I was wondering, you know, how many people out there don't really understand what crypto is? 
uh, that's one of the, you know, when you're writing, you assume that people know what you're talking about, but that's not necessarily the case. I've also been in a situation uh, years earlier when I was editor of a mortgage magazine. I did a webinar about um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, mm. which is you know, HUD, which is the acronym. And during the webinar, I was, uh, I was mentioning HUD and I was mentioning uh, the GSEs, the Government Services Enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And uh, in the chat room, somebody uh, typed in, uh, what's a GSC? And I thought, oh, <laughs> and I actually said on the air, how do you like that? Somebody's uh, having some fun at our expense. And a couple of other people said, uh, no, what is a GSC? We don't know. And this was an audience of real estate professionals. And I was under the assumption that they knew what uh, policy was all about. But they didn't. And I'm also wondering, too, if many people who are reading me on Benzinga or reading the competition are aware of what cryptocurrency is. And uh, when we're talking about uh, Bitcoin or Dogecoin or any of the other coins, uh, if they fully understand how it works, what it's meant to do, what it's not meant to do. And that's been a challenge as a writer is just to uh, create work which those who are plugged in know what's going on, but I'm always on the lookout for new readers and eager to introduce them to the subject. And I don't want to have something which is just too ar arcane and too esoteric that it would just lose them. Yeah, I and I appreciate that about your writing. Um, and it's, to me, um, I think it's one of the things that distinguishes you from all the other uh, people in the space that, that cover it. Um, it Generally, your writing style, from what I picked up, the way the way you tackle cryptocurrency, um, it's a it's just a bit more entertaining. And and you could I could tell uh, the the more I learned, rather the more I learned about your previous body of work, the more your writing style, as far as how you uh, tackle cryptocurrency, the way you write about it, it makes a lot more sense as to why I find your writing regarding it uh, more engaging and more entertaining. So. Um, yeah, and I know I know I've turned on a lot of folks uh, in my community to your writing, and they uh, I'm sure most of them feel the same way as well. Jason Upman coming in with a twenty dollar super chat. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that for the time and effort. Thanks, Phil, for being here with us. Thank you, real deal, Stephen Steele. Happy one year celebration show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it, uh, Jason. And uh, you've thank always you, Jason. yeah. yeah yes. Thank thanks for helping to keep the lights on, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Um, so. What are a few, actually I wanted to get your thoughts on this because this is something that's been uh, a story that's been changing by the day and it's just got some interesting dynamics to it. I'm sure you got a few thoughts of it. I'm still kind of assessing and trying to make heads and tails of it myself. Recently, um, Elon Musk was offered a, a chair on the board of directors and then it seemed like, and then he backed out. It, it appears that he's the one that maybe backed out after having what appears to be a not so um, an, a not so great engagement, perhaps with the CEO or the other uh, the other directors. Uh, your thoughts? It's an interesting situation because uh, Elon, of course, for the longest time has been talking about how Twitter operates on Twitter, <laughs> ironically enough, and it's they just finally said, "Okay, come on in." and invited him and because he made the stock purchase they didn't necessarily have to invite him to the uh, to the board because of that but he decided they brought him in and it's funny it's like it's sort of like somebody who always fantasizes about wanting to be a broadway star and then suddenly finds himself on the stage and realize this isn't really what i thought it was going to be and i think that was the situation with, with elon musk because he had this idea of what Twitter could be and make the changes to the algorithm and the edit button, et cetera, et cetera. But they brought him into the company and they said, all right, you want to be here in the company, um, you can be a director, but, and they made it very clear that he was not going to be changing policy and he was not going to have an executive position. And I, for whatever reason, I get the impression that he thought that maybe once he was there, he could start enacting the change but he didn't really have the allies within the company or not within the board uh to agitate for that change and from what i understand the workforce at twitter wasn't all that happy to have him 
And the, I think for me, the deal killer for him was when uh, Parag Agarwal, the CEO at Twitter, uh, set up a Q&A with Elon and the Twitter workforce where they would be able to pepper him with questions. And uh, Elon's a lot of fun on Twitter when he's, he's tweeting to his followers. He's a lot of fun when he's on the stage like he was in Austin the other day for the opening of the Giga Factory. He's fun on Saturday Night Live where he's uh, he has all this goofy comedy. But these are all very controlled in environments and it's not really a spontaneous one-on-one. -on -one. You may have noticed that he doesn't do very many interviews. In fact, I don't think he's done any interview this year. Uh, the last time he did a Q&A was with the folks from the Babylon Bee on right. YouTube, which I thought was kind of... First, I thought that was a Babylon Bee article because I couldn't believe they were asking <laughs> serious questions. But uh, sure enough, that was uh, that was that. And I think he, he may have realized that he he put off way more than he would, could possibly handle, mm -hmm. uh, and and then retreated from that. Uh, he has this very comfortable perch where he's able to criticize and make comments about how the company operates, but. Uh, when he's faced with reality, like I said, the, with the daydreamer who wants to be a Broadway star and is suddenly in the spotlight and realizes, wait a minute, I, I, this isn't where I should be. I, I, I can't do this mm. and gets off the stage. And I think that's what happened to him. I think that uh, when the uh, reality uh, took over from the daydream, it just wasn't fun anymore. Yeah, I, I think that uh, sounds like some pretty astute observations. Now, uh, by the way, Diamond Hands Freddy, uh, thank you for the $10 super chat. Happy anniversary, folks. We got this. I love it. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Diamond Hands Freddy. And thanks for uh, thanks for uh, sending with us uh, on this journey this last year. Getting back to this topic at Handfill, um, it seems to me that uh, Elon from here has a pretty limited options, but interesting ones. He could either walk away uh, and just go on with his usual trolling, or... Uh, he could uh, be uh, reassessing and re and will re-engage at a later date with what he is going to consider to be a more aggressive strategy. Obviously, now that he's not sitting on the board of directors, it enables him to buy more than the agreed 14% cap of the company. Uh, so he could perhaps think he could perhaps buy more percentage of the company, thinking that that might. Uh, sway, and then maybe he could work behind the scenes to perhaps curry favor for his vision of Twitter with other shareholders, or uh, he could team up with another platform, or, or uh, maybe have a team work on a new platform. Uh, what are your thoughts going forward with this? I don't see him working on another platform because it's expensive to start another platform, and there already are other platforms that haven't taken off. There's Parler, uh, there's Getter, uh, granted, those are more right-wing, but still, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were based as a, an alternative to Twitter. Uh, and even when Donald Trump was banned from Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, followers didn't really leave Twitter to go over there in mass and never come back. They're still on Twitter, including his son, Donald Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, if Elon can enact change from the outside, it would be interesting because the, the Twitter team sort of made it clear that they're the ones who decide what's going on in Twitter. We have to remember, too, Twitter is a private company, and they are not a, it's not the public domain, and they can set their own rules. Some of these rules might seem arbitrary. Some of them might seem bizarre. I've been, I've been banned from Twitter twice Wow! Uh, for making impolite comments about uh, some prominent women. Hmm. And I learned my lesson from that. I, I realized that... I, even though I'm from the Bronx, I just can't be a smart ass all the time. <laughs> and in this setting, I, I know not to uh, not to open a big mouth. Uh, he has certainly opened the debate as to just what is the role of social media. After the election, if there is a change in the uh, whatever party runs the Congress, and it, it, at this point it looks like it's going to sway to the Republicans, uh, there might be more of a focus uh, from Capitol Hill to uh, investigate what's going on, not only in Twitter, but also at Facebook and the other platforms as well. And that might be able to uh, force them to make some changes in terms of uh, algorithms and who can participate in what is considered a terms of service violation. Uh, I think Elon started the ball rolling. Whether or not he's going to be the one holding the ball at the end of the ball's journey, that remains to be seen. But I don't think it was done in vain. But I just think that... Uh, 
in a, in a way they caught him off guard by bringing him in and then him sort of abruptly pulling back. It didn't seem like a very Elon type move, but again, this is only the first uh, part of what's going to be a very interesting saga. Yeah, I, I completely concur, and I think that's really well stated. Now, Nick Balls is in the chat. Uh, welcome, Nick. Great to see you, sir. Well, of course, Nick is going to be on the show to... I forget if I have you down for t- uh, tomorrow night or Thursday, Nick. i got to look on the roster again. I think Thursday, Thursday night. Um, but um, great to, it's great to see you in here, uh, Nick. Nick has an interesting comment. Uh, uh, he says, Twitter has, built, has a built-in user base much like Jeff Bezos. Uh, Elon is looking for the uh, media piece of his crown jewel, much like Jeff with his newspaper. Elon could perform a hostile takeover. Uh, Phil, do you think that's possible that Elon right now is working on um, some more long-term kind of chess moves regarding this whole thing, wherein uh, it, he, he could shift it towards something more like a takeover? Well, a hostile takeover is going to cost a lot of money. And even if he was to finance it himself, I don't know if it's going to be uh, the right use of his money. Uh, I don't know if he's looking for a media platform of his own. He has it already. I mean, he has 81 million people following him on Twitter. And I think that's more than people watching CNN or Fox or any of the the news channels. Mm. So unless Twitter bans him, uh, I don't see why he would need to uh, start a, a new platform, certainly pay for it out of his uh, considerable wallet. Mm-hmm. He's getting free publicity, and I used to run a public relations agency. It was one of the many things I've done. And I have to admire Elon for the way that he's been able to use the media to his advantage. Uh, people like to point out that Tesla has never paid for one penny of advertising since he's been this in charge of the company. And mm-hmm. it doesn't need because you can't uh, go through a day without going on Twitter or any of the other platforms, or for that matter, reading Benzinga and uh, not seeing Elon's name. Yeah, well stated there. I think the main thing that I like about Elon's Twitter presence is he seemed to have shifted, shifted the Overton window of public discourse on Twitter, wherein he's in a position where he can, where honestly, I think he says things and posts memes that would get a lot of us, frankly, shadow banned or ghost banned. But the fact that uh, Elon uh, can do it um, and him owning 9% uh, of the shares right now kind of shields him. And plus, because he brings such uh, um, a huge user base uh, to Twitter, uh, I think he's, I think he's pretty well shielded to to be able to express himself in this way, and a lot of people really feel that Elon Musk speaks for them. And I think, I, I mean, it sounds absurd because he's a he's the richest man in the world, but I think it's because he's this populist billionaire, you know, uh, wherein um, obviously he's tapping in to sentiments of a lot of uh, disenfranchised people. Your thoughts? Well, I don't see them banning him unless he really does something completely bizarre. Um, Twitter can do whatever it wants and ban whoever it wants. Don't forget to ban the President of the United States. So, mm. uh, well, granted, he only had uh, about two weeks left in the job when they did that, but still, he is the President of the United States. Uh, in thinking about Elon, it's interesting because you stop and think about it, Steve. Can you name it five other corporate leaders that command the level of respect and adoration that Elon does? Uh, honestly, I can't. I, I can name corporate executives, but mm-hmm. I don't know anyone who has that kind of uh, public uh, cult following the way that he would. I mean, you're not going to see that with Jeff Bezos. Uh, you're not going to see it, certainly not with Zuckerberg or mm. Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Jamie Dimon, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Elon is sort of, a, he, he's a rock star of the corporate world, and there aren't any other rock stars in the corporate world. Mm. So he, he has that platform to himself until such time that another Elon Musk would emerge. But I don't know if that's possible, because a lot of people, when they finally get to the CEO position, they're, they're very circumspect and 
very stiff and they don't want to seem spontaneous but here's somebody who's uh making benny hill type jokes on twitter and and making fun <laughs> of himself on saturday night live so uh he is one in a million in that sense and uh i'm i'm glad we have him and i'm also glad too that he's one of the uh the very few corporate executives who's able to speak uh passionately and freely about crypto as well because mm -hmm. you're not getting conversations about anyone else it's funny i did an interview with um anthony sanders who's a highly regarded economist and i had said to him you know you we hear elon musk talking about uh, crypto but we don't hear janet yellen talking about it uh, mm. and uh, we have some a vehicle here not just bitcoin but crypto as a whole and we don't really hear about it from the government we don't hear about it from other leaders of industry uh even in the media too benzinga is sort of unique because we do have a very heavy focus on crypto if you're going to go to the wall street journal or bloomberg or financial times or the other financial papers you're not going to see that level of coverage so and one of the things i'm i love about a show like this is that uh, we have a community of like-minded people who want to hear about it who want to discuss it and we have people who are watching the show and of course we have you bringing guests on uh to talk about it because let's face it if you turn on cnn or you turn on fox news or uh, pr you're not going to hear this kind of a conversation yeah yeah well stated there um and it's it's great to have you in the mix and uh i know the folks uh the folks really do like your work here and so uh you gotta, you gotta be in. You got, we gotta have you in the rotation now, Phil. You're, you're in, man. You're stuck with us. Um, okay. That's great. Okay, so, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you were, uh, you're born in the Bronx, educated in uh, the New York City public school system, which yeah. was uh, pretty, pretty intense conditions there between uh, incredible overcrowding of classrooms and just rats running around everywhere and. Uh, yes. sewers flooding the streets and uh, when, whenever it uh, rained and so what do you think um, this sort of uh, upbringing in your childhood has maybe carried over into your uh, perspective and your uh, your just stylistically in your body of work you know what it's funny I went to John F. Kennedy High School in the Bronx and it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> the school went downhill so quickly, they actually um, uh, took it apart and uh, they, they assigned the building to other schools as well. But there were rats running around the campus of the school, as you mentioned, when it rained, the sewers around the school flooded. We used to call it Lake Kennedy because the streets were all uh, thick with water. Uh, we had maybe 35 students to a class. Uh, the bathrooms didn't have doors on the stalls. It, it was a mess, but I didn't know any better. And it wasn't until many years later uh, that I started to go out in the world and meet other people and learn about other people's experiences that I realized that uh, what I went through wasn't normal. But <laughs> at the time, because I was not exposed to anything else, I assumed, all right, well, you go to school, you, you go to school with rats and flooded sewers and uh, vandalized bathrooms, and that's just part of the course, that's growing up. And I think the lesson that I learned from that, it's, it's certainly not one of trauma, because high school was a very happy time for me, mm. but it's that uh, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation that we consider to be normal, but either through the passage of time or another circumstance where we're taken out of our surroundings and put into another surrounding, we realized that what we considered normal was not normal. And that's not the way that any person should be living. I, I if I certainly, if I, I don't have children, at least I'm not aware of any, but <laughs> if I did have children, I wouldn't send them to a school like uh, I went to. Uh, granted, it, w it was a happy time for me, but looking back, I'm, I'm still flabbergasted that I never realized that having rats in the school was a problem. Uh, back then, it was just, oh, look, there's a rat. We, we got to get to class. And <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Uh, if if I if I could pivot uh, again, um, just a bit back to touch on film here. I was just curious. This, I was just curious as to your uh, your answer on this. At what point 
does the film become so bad it's good? And then conversely, at what point is the film just so bad it's just it's just bad? Well, it's all about personal taste. <clears throat> Um, people mm -hmm. say to me, what's the worst film ever made? I'm, well, I don't know. I mean, there are films that I think are terrible. Uh, there are films that I like that other people don't like. There are films that are considered classics that I dislike. Uh, I was actually, if I'm not mistaken, the first film critic um, to give a good review to Heaven's Gate. Mm. That uh, infamous uh, Western epic that lost a lot of money and sank United Artists. When the film came out in 1980, it was uh, it was considered to be one of the worst things ever made. Then over time, it had disappeared, and then it was revived. I think it was like 2004, or 2005. There was a screening in New York, and I saw the film and I was wondering, this film isn't the worst thing ever made. It's, I mean, it has problems, but I liked it, mm. and I wrote the review, and then other people started to to speak up, say, yes, I liked it too, and I. I got a lot of very nasty comments from people who thought I was an idiot for saying I liked Heaven's Gate, but uh, I did, and over time the film gained more respect. It actually played at the Cannes Film Festival, got a standing ovation, and it's been available on the Criterion Collection on DVD and Blu-ray, which is considered to be the gold standard of the home entertainment labels. So, hmm. uh, I mean, we could say, oh, Heaven's Gate's the worst thing ever made. Well, in your opinion, it is. I mean, hmm. I love it only like, uh, there was a little dinky film from 1952 called Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn, meets a Brooklyn Gorilla, and most <laughs> people think, "Oh, that's a terrible film." But uh, I actually have hosted film festivals and I've screened the movie, and the film gets huge laughs, uh, not out of derision but out of genuine joy. They were laughing with the movie, and it, right. it gets applause at the end. And people say, "Oh, Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn Gorilla is a terrible movie." Well. I like it, and, and the people I screened it for liked it as well. So, uh, what's good, what's not good? Uh, it's all a matter of opinion. Yeah, well stated there. And a film, just like any other artistic medium, it's it's an it's a subjective one. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you're right. But I actually do remember uh, Heaven's Gate, and I enjoyed it as well, starring Chris Christopherson. I remember think I remember watching it remembering this is really long i remember that i remember it was a really long film but uh i yeah i, I enjoy it as well so uh you, what you're saying is that film essentially well it, it started to gain more respect over time yeah it does a lot of films that were considered flops when they first came out gain respect over time some become classics uh, right alfred hitchcock's vertigo uh, wasn't well received when it came out today it's considered one of the masterpieces of the 1950s and there are other films that were popular when they came out that get forgotten over time. So uh, time's kind of funny like that. It uh, changes a lot of people's perspectives. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's that's a really astute observation to make. And I I can't help but think of Blade Runner too. That did pretty dismally in the theater, and of course that went on to be heralded as one of the best science fiction films of all time. Of course, it didn't help that it came out the same summer as E.T. But uh, yeah, no. What are you gonna What are you gonna do? People are in the chat are talking about. Uh, let's see, uh, Evil Dead Two, uh, Evil Dead. They call me Bruce. A lot of Bruce Campbell fans here. It looks oh, like. Yeah. yeah are are you? Call me Bruce. Great film. Yeah, yeah. It that that is a good one. That is a good one. And um, hey, I'm on the screen. I'm on the screen for a bit. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks for dealing with all this time, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they call me Bruce is great. Uh, I think Army of Darkness, too, was like, um, that came out after the Evil Dead movies, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Phil, right now you are hosting a couple different shows. One is Nutmeg Chatter, which is the one that, that I was on. That's on a, a public radio station on the East Coast, right? It's on uh, WAPJ in Torrington, Connecticut, and five other stations in uh, Connecticut as well. It's also online at nutmegchatter.com. And yes, you you were a guest on the show. We talked about crypto for a half hour. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. And uh, where else, uh, what, what's the other show that you're doing weekly? The other show is called The Online Movie Show. It's a podcast which is on SoundCloud. You just go to slash online movie.
uh, you're not uh, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, I broke up for a minute there, but uh, I'm back. I'm back. Um, just let me know if you can hear me, Phil. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> One second, guys. All right, all right. I am trying to figure it out here. There we okay. go. Uh, Phil, can you hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sorry, just like a snafu. Everything just went uh, crazy <laughs> for about like 60 seconds, but we're back. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, as uh, I think we were talking about... Okay, so the sec... Again, where we picked up, the second show is called what that you do weekly? It's called The Online Movie Show. It's a weekly podcast on SoundCloud, and you can find it at uh, soundcloud.com slash online movie show. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and so where else can folks uh, find you aside from there? You're on Twitter, of course, uh, uh, at Phil Hall. You're a pretty easy guy to find. Um, and uh, anything else you want to plug before we uh, call this one a wrap, Phil? Yes, I also write for Cinema Crazed, and you can find me um, at uh, cinema-crazed.com. I do uh, film reviews there as well. Uh, I also have performed with an online, uh, not an online, a radio drama company called Nutmeg Junction, and one of the things I did for them, I did a radio play based on Moby Dick. And <laughs> oh, my gosh. Captain Ahab. So, so you you can say that for another show. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I mean, there's there's so many there's actually so many more questions that I have for you. Part of me needs to sh uh, shut this down because because of all the technical difficulties I've had, and I want to brave it for another day. Another reason why is because I want to save all the extras that I'm thinking to have you back real soon. Will you come back soon, Phil? I will come back soon, and thank you, Jason Huffman, for those $50. $50, make you holler. Biggest super chat of the night. Thank you so much, Jason. Says, for new equipment, I mean, what's up with this? Uh, fair enough, fair enough. I'm on it. I'm on it, guys. And uh, we'll have, I'll, I'll have, I'm going to spend the day making sure all the bugs are ironed out before coming on tomorrow and the next. Um, anyway, guys, if you don't already f uh, follow Phil Hall on Twitter, make sure you give Phil Hall a follow there, and so you can uh, keep up with uh, his work there and we will certainly certainly have Phil Hall back he is certainly real deal Steven Steele material for sure and now you're in the club sir you are in the mix Phil thank you so much for joining us tonight and we can't, ha can't wait to have you back I can't wait to be back thank you so much thank you everybody watching the show uh, look forward to seeing you again don't forget to uh, read Benzinga look for Phil Hall File on at Benzinga. You know you're in for good stuff when you see Phil Hall at Benzinga. That's true. I love it. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Until next time, this is your man, Real Deal, Stephen Steele, and the one and only Phil Hall. Signing out. Thanks again, guys.